We're ready, Gilbert. Hey, give me one second. Okay, I think we're ready now. All right, join palms. Bow. Four great vows. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless vexations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain supreme Buddhahood. Okay, welcome to you all. Um, I'm just literally coming in the door from, from a trial out of the area. So um, I barely made it here, but I, I made it. And so I'm sorry for being a little bit late, but we're uh, going to continue on with Master Holmgren and his um, uh, instructions on the practice of Chan. The most important uh, thing that he's been talking about and it is his refrain is by uh, maintaining the awareness of the true mind. And uh, again, today you'll hear him uh, talking about this, maintaining the awareness of the true mind. And this is really Chan. It, it's really the instructions of all the patriarchs. It's the instructions of all the Buddhas, of all the sutras is maintaining this awareness. And this is something that I stress in terms of meditation is that we have to have awareness. Now, this is the awareness of the true mind. Um, it is not thinking. Um, and uh, unfortunately, because I uh, had to uh, to travel out of the area and just getting back. I didn't prepare things I wanted to prepare in terms of diagrams for you. But um, the what I wanted to do is show you that awareness is, let's say, very big. In all directions, there's awareness. It is not thinking. It is not thinking of whatever is appearing. It is just knowing that it is appearing. This is what we call a state of equipoise or state of equanimity. In a state of equanimity, everything is appearing perfectly and one is aware of it without having to turn the mind's eye towards it. Now, when we practice and we use this awareness, this is the same awareness that what they're saying is maintaining this awareness of the true mind. The true mind is not what we believe to be uh, an ego personality or life and being. It is, it is mind itself. It is that which is real. It, it's not a false sense of, of being. It is the, the self nature of mind. And the self nature of mind is that it has a, a, an awareness by virtue of the fact that it is the mind ground itself and it is the perception of the mind ground and they're not two things they're one it is not easy for us to think this way because we live in a state of samsara which is a dualistic um, uh, world and in this dualistic world there's subject and object and there's these three dimensions and um, that we seem to be traveling in and spatially and temporally, time-wise as well, that there's a, what we might appear to be a two-dimensional in terms of time going like this, traveling from one point. But if we cannot establish the point from where the time began as being a real point from which to depart from, then the whole concept of time breaks down. This is something that Nagarjuna did in the Madhya uh, Makasko and was looking at it and saying, and he refuted the idea of time as being existent, uh, as well as, as, as space. We look at this and it begins to make us double check in terms of where we're at and what we're doing and, and double check in terms of that 
whether we're um, whether we're in a real place or not. And that's what's important here is, is that when we're looking at things, we have to use the perception of mind itself. This is the awareness of the mind, of the true mind. And we're not confused. We do not possess anything. We should not have any confusion about the world as well. And, and this is what Master Hongren is emphasizing. So with that, we'll, we'll move on, except to understand that this is how we meditate, is that we maintain the awareness that's there. There is a contemplation that happens. The contemplation is not thinking. It is directly looking at the method. The method is a thought. But as a thought, it, since one is only looking at one thought, it, it becomes meaningless. And if it's a Watto, it's meaningless. So whatever we're looking at is just understood to be there just to keep center of, of, of the consciousness clear of any kinds of thoughts that could be cling to. Okay, so let's go where we what happens here and i might start back where i was uh, uh, left off the last time but i i i think um it still is uh perhaps uh, very very useful for you so the third question is why is maintaining the true mind the basic principle of the entire buddhist canon buddhist canon means anything that was ever written about buddha dharma and they're saying, why is it maintained that this is the basic principle um, of that if we maintain this true mind? And, um, and the answer is throughout the canon, the Tathagatha preaches extensively. And, and by the way, um, uh, Santa, you could put up the, the, this was page two of seven. Okay. Teaches extensively about all types of transgression and good fortune causes and conditions and rewards and retributions. And uh, I'll kind of paraphrase it here. He also draws upon uh, various things such as world mountains to make innumerable metaphors. He also manifests innumerable superpowers and various kinds of transformation. All these are just the Buddha's ways of teaching foolish sentient beings. Since they have various kinds of desires and myriad of psychological differences, the Tathagatha draws them into a permanent bliss according to their mental ten tendencies. And this here is what he's is showing the manner in which the, uh, the Buddha is teaching. And you'll see the question here and the answer. Thank you, Santa. Um, and I, what I wanted to do is emphasize by showing you this how you study the Dharma. So all of this is about how you study and, and, and making sure that you are, are clear about how you read things such as this, because this is very, very deep. And if we just read it very quickly, we lose, we lose all of, of what it really means. But here where they're saying the Buddha's way of teaching foolish sentient beings is, is that when we are attached to the idea that we are separate and apart from others or that this mind that we're using is the Buddha. Therefore, if I have consciousness, I am a Buddha. It isn't that I am a Buddha. This body cannot be a Buddha. That which is using this mind is the Buddha mind, but it does not have a name, whether we call it the Buddha or Gilbert or whatever, it isn't in this way. There's no, there's no um, duality there. But if, um, if you use the name, hey, Gilbert, and Gilbert turns around, that's the Buddha mind that's turning around. This is a part that's a little bit tricky, a little bit esoteric, but, but it's something that you need to look at and try to figure out how that works. 
But when he's talking about foolish sentient beings, he's talking about people that are stuck in samsara and making choices based on the idea that they are separate and apart and that there is an ego present. Um, and, and so that's why he says the Tathagata draws them into permanent bliss according to their mental tendencies. Uh, so in, that, in other words, there's various levels at which one can, um, can expose um, Buddha Dharma to others on it. Unfortunately, the default program is the lowest common denominator, just cross your legs and hope for the best. But we should have the availability of this esoteric or this more profound dharma. And if we can understand it, great. If we can't, perhaps one day we will. But if you never hear it, then you don't have a chance. So it's important for you to have this ability to to have a chance to be able to, to hear this profound dharma that Master Hongrung is presenting. And he says that, uh, understand clearly that the Buddha nature embodied within sentient beings is inherently, Im inherently pure. Now, this is the part that's kind of tricky, you see, because he says the Buddha nature embodied within sentient beings. It doesn't say the Buddha nature of sentient beings. It's something that's there, kind of like your DNA, but does that DNA define you as an individual or as a continuum? And it's kind of an interesting thing here because he's looking at this and saying, I don't want to say that you will become enlightened. What I'm saying is, is that there is a Buddha nature within all of those appearances that we call consciousness, but it's actually the Buddha mind. But if you think about it in the wrong way, then it becomes your consciousness. That's why we were talking about that many times where it says that sages return consciousness to mind Fools turn mind into consciousness. So we continue. Like a sun underlaid by clouds. Um, and this is interesting. Listen to, listen to the way he says this. Because he doesn't say like, um, like a sky that, um, that has clouds in the sky. What word is he using here that's peculiar? Like, so he's saying, like a sun underlaid by clouds. It's like, all right, the light behind me here, if that was the sun, then the clouds would be here. And then some sorrow would be underneath here. So he's using the Buddha perception to say not that we're looking at the sky and seeing that the sky is cloudy and we can't see space because of it. He's using it in the opposite way to say, turn the mind's eye inward and looking from, from the, uh, the perception of mind itself, looking down onto samsara and underlaid it is, is these clouds that make it unclear. We cannot see what's there. What, what do you think is, is underneath all those clouds? What do you think? Anybody? What do you think is underneath the clouds? If you're looking up from above, looking down, this, of course, this is a trick, Chan question. But what do you think? What, what is underneath those clouds? It's like the diagram that I showed you where one half of the sphere is the knowing aspect of mind and then there's the Dharmakaya and then things appear. And then we turned it this way, right? And so now we're looking from here and underneath here, there's clouds around here 
but it's all mind. You're looking at the mind. We perceive clouds because our minds are obstructed, but all of it is mind perfectly appearing. And, and we're seeing it all. It, it's underlaid. The mind is underlaid here. Mind looking at mind. And, and we don't have to worry about where the dust goes because it's all part of mind. So it's very interesting use of words here. And if you go too quickly, you'll miss it. You'll miss that incredible like clue that, that he's giving there. Okay, let's see. Um, by just distinct maintaining awareness of the true minds the clouds of false thoughts will go away and the sun of wisdom will appear of course because if this is the mind and this is the mind and they're both mirrors and the light is going to appear right there the moon will appear it's because it's always been there Why make any further study of knowledge based on senses? Now, this is a part we have to be careful about because otherwise you interpret it and say, well, you know, Master Holmgren said we don't have to study. But he didn't say that. He's saying that, that why make further study of knowledge based on senses? Okay, uh, which only leads to suffering and samsara. So the knowledge, you know, I'm very, very smart. I can make a lot of money. And, and it makes my senses happy because I can buy things that, that taste good or I can dress up this way or I can live this way or whatever, never knowing that I'm still stuck in the cycle of samsara because I'm trying to appease the senses of this illusory sentient being. But we believe that it's real. And he's saying, don't study in this way, because if you study in this way and you're trying to look for the for the Buddha mind, you cannot do it in this way. All concepts as well as all as well as affairs of the three periods of time should be understood according to the metaphor of polishing a mirror. When the dust is gone, nature naturally manifests. That which is learned by the ignorant mind is completely useless. So it's interesting because as I practice, I find that I really, don't practice to maintain this library of Gilbert for Gilbert's sake. It's useless for me to do that. If I did that, what good is it? In another few years, Gilbert will not be here. It's all going to be gone. It's just completely gone. So there's nothing I can do. I mentioned that as an, as a metaphor, grabbing a handful of sand and trying to hold on to it. Eventually, it'll all go away. You're not going to be able to hold it. So Master Hongren is reorienting you towards the Buddha nature and the self nature of mind and, and not trying to cling to the idea of a of a life and being, which is transitory, which changes. It is conditioned. And he's pointing towards the unconditioned. As a matter of fact, I think he's coming up to say that in a moment. Um, uh, that which is learned by the ignorant mind is completely useless. True learning is that which is learned um, and, and I circled it here, and actually in, on mine, I even put it in green felt tip, um, by the inactive or unconditioned wu-wei mind, which never ceases 
correct mindfulness. That's an awful lot that's being said here. Okay, this is where we have to slow down again, because if we don't slow down, we just miss it. If you just read this, you'd go, oh, that was very good. What does it mean? I don't know. Well, let's slow down. So he's saying true learning is that which is learned. And I put here, how so? How, how is it learned? By the inactive or unconditioned Wu Wei mind. So this Wu Wei mind is, we could say, the no thinking mind, the emptiness of, of, of mind, it's unconditioned. And so, um, which never ceases correct mindfulness, again, maintaining this awareness is also maintaining the correct mindfulness. And so as we're doing this and we're it's saying this true learning isn't learned by you, it is by the inactive or unconditioned Wu Wei mind. So, um, so we continue and he says, although this is called true learning, ultimately there's nothing to be learned. Why is that? There's nothing to be learned. Does that make sense to you? There's nothing to be learned. Why would there be nothing to be learned? Anybody? Nobody wants to talk about these very deep and profound things. Yes. A new player up. Come on in. <laughs> Go ahead and unmute her. Uh, could you please raise your hand so that I can find you? It's under reactions. Keep trying. Ah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, by the way, you got my... the you you got the message. I wanted you to answer the question. Yes. Uh, so what I'm thinking that is that um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> Sorry. I All forgot. right. It's okay. The question was, is, is that, you know, when it says this true learning, why is it saying why, why is nothing there's to nothing learned? to learn? Because any concept that we're learning, there is the opposite of that. So it's still in, within that dualism and it doesn't matter whatever it is, the concept, kind of like the, uh, the mirror, uh, you have to keep it polished and keep it clean. And which is true that we're practicing Buddhism, but at the same time is that to understand that there's no mirror in the first place. So any concept will create that dualism. It's like that dualistic nature. Are we practicing Buddhism or is Buddhism practicing us? It's very interesting, huh? cannot be answered <laughs> that's why i wanted you to um to ask the question because it, i can see a potential in you and you're listening so that's good you're fearless to answer the question but you see it's like who is who is playing who if we are illusory then how can the mechanical puppet learn anything there's nothing to be learned except for the fact that the the human beings are the mechanical puppet that are pulled around by by karma but yet this karma also belongs to mind mind then is it really that it learns as much as it awakens from the dream awakening from the dream means that it no longer clings to this to this life and being. So you're correct. So it's good. So you're you're there, but all I did was just push you just a little bit more to say who is playing who. You see? So it's good. Hang in there. You're 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 doing well. So I give you an A so far. Okay. All right. Well I continue back. And then your your first name is Tori. Oh she's you muted her again. 
Your first name is Tori? Yes. Uh, actually, we met at the, the three-day retreat. I was one of the participants. Oh, your hair's different today. Oh, I didn't tie it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. No problem. All right. I think you had it pulled back. Yeah, right. I had a title. <laughs> okay, good. All right. That's good. Thank you. But you're, you're right on this. Okay. So then we, we go. So that's why he said there's nothing to be learned. And then he says, why is this? A perfect time for him to ask that question. Why is this? So now we're looking at it and saying, why is there nothing to be learned? Because the Buddha mind doesn't need to learn anything. It is whatever is there. It knows. Because the self and nirvana are both non-substantial, they are neither different nor the same. This is very, very tough. We've got to look at this because you run into it and then you find, okay, this doesn't quite, you know, what is, the heck does that mean? Because the self and nirvana are both non-substantial. So what is substantial is the unconditioned mind. But nirvana and the self, they belong to this side. They belong to the samsaric side, not the, a projection on the mind, on the mirror mind. So they're neither different nor the same. No, because we, we do not say that, that they ha have the same component. We could say, that they're, they're the same in one way and different in another way. Um, the nirvana being that one realizes and awakened to it, and the other one is the self, you know, and saying one can be awakened from the self, from the idea of the self, but they're still, they're same in the sense that they are uh, projections on the mind. And, and so even this concept of nirvana is not the Buddha mind. Therefore, the essential principle of the words, nothing to be learned is true. Nothing to be learned is true because everything is mine. One, and, and one of the things that's kind of interesting about mine and as one gets more and more realizations, what before used to confound us and we didn't understand why people did this? Why did he do that to me? I can't believe he did that to me or she did that to me, whatever it is. And then you go, oh, I understand because this person is this way. And as a result of it, this and this and this happened. And you become clearer and clearer about this uh, in terms of understanding, you know, because you step away from the idea of yourself and, are, and looking at it from, from uh, a different viewpoint. So it says, um, one must maintain the clear awareness of the true mind without generating false thoughts or the illusion of personal possession. This is also very, very important because one, it's saying maintaining the clear awareness of the true mind. And so this, what is the true mind? What is appearing in the moment is the true mind. It's not separate from the self nor nirvana. It's perfectly appearing. The awareness is there to know precisely why appearances are happening. Why did I have this thought? Why did I have this emotional fear or, or emotional desire or, or whatever it is that's coming up? Mind knows it because you put it there from, from all of these karmic conditions and things that are there that are coming up, we see clearly that, that it's there. And if we maintain this mind in this way, so that we see everything in this way, then it says, without generating false thought. Okay, so what are false thoughts? Thoughts where you go, you know, I'm gonna get even with that person, or I'm gonna tell them the next time I see him, or whatever, or I, you know, I, I really, would like a raspberry donut right now, you know? And, and your body's telling you, no, Gilbert, trust me, don't eat a 
raspberry donut right now. You don't need one, okay? Who told you you were supposed to have one? You know, that's a false thought, right? But we listen to it all the time. We're listening to, to it. Why? Our body, if we listen to our body, our body would say, uh, 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 Gilbert, enough with those. You don't need that, okay? No, I'm, and I'm not even getting into cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, whatever that's out there. You name it, you know, gambling or whatever. Um, no, that's there. And there's all sorts of gambling one can take. But in any case, but then it says the illusion of personal possession. This is an interesting one. Because what are the things that we have that we are, that we believe are our possessions? Okay. What is the major one that we believe is our personal possession? Come on. All right, Santa, I can see you. You know, what is it? Body. The body, yeah, the body. This is my body, not your body. My body may want to be close to this person or may not want to be close to him or whatever, but your body is your first number one personal possession. And you want to do this and do that to it and fix it up and, and all sorts of things. It's your number one. And then things that belong to you. And so it's, it's very, very interesting because we don't understand that. There's a very um, uh, well-known story, or it should be well-known, at least in, in my opinion, um, about, um, let me see. Didn't have a chance to put everything in the right order here. And um, about, um, this one master, Nan Quan, and uh, Zhao Zhou, and uh, Nan Quan was there. And let me see, you have a picture of, uh, of Nan Quan with the cat? Santa, no? Okay, yeah, this, this is the one that Mike, uh, Michael shared, uh, you shared with Michael. One, one moment, let me check. Yeah, so you didn't get it well. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Let me share it. All right. This is a very interesting story. One moment. So two monks came to, to Nan Quan. Um, and they had, um, they were fighting over this cat that's in the picture there. And if you look and you'll see that Nan Quan has in his right hand um, a, a sword and he wants to show the duality of the cat because both of the people, both of the monks wanted to keep the cat. And so when they, when they, um, wanted to keep the cat one said i brought him into to the temple the other one said but he sleeps with me at night you know i don't ask him he just well he's my cat and the other one said no he's my cat and so the the master then um he cut the cat in half okay and um i know there's a lot of cat lovers that would probably be horrified by this and there's a lot of not cat lovers that would probably go and, but he, it, because he cut the cat in half is what makes the story. Because whether he did it or not, and you know, between you and me, I don't think he did cut the cat in half. I think he just went like he was gonna cut the cat in half. At least I give him the benefit of the doubt. But in any case, he cuts the cat in half, there you are to the one, and there's the other half there. I don't know which one got the better half or he, whether he split them down the middle or cut them, you know, around the belly or whatever, but he gives it to them and they, 
take take their calf. And so this whole idea of possession is one and where one, oh, well, it's yours, you have the cat. Well, no, not really, you don't have the cat. It, it's, it's like not what I expected. I mean, you know, I don't want this half of a cat. And, and so, but the point is, is that, that it's how we look at things and how we try to cling to things and how we have these personal possessions. And then we suffer from that. And so it's very interesting in this way. So at that point, Sao So came, came back to the monastery and he went into the master's uh, quarters and they were telling him, you just can't believe what just happened right now. You know, and they told him the whole story and then, you know, and so Zazo listened to the story very carefully. And then he put his slippers on the top of his head and walked out of the room. Very, very famous story. And, and so the master said, as he was seeing Zazo leaving the room, um, that uh, if he was here, he could have saved the cat. And, and the whole idea is that, you know, we're upside down in, in, all of this because we just simply don't understand. We don't have an idea of, of that even when we try to hold on to these personal possessions, they are transitory, very quickly gone. If we live our life like this, we repeat samsara. We just keep coming back to it and coming back to it. And so we, we see things in this way. You know, sometimes I see a lot of articles about how to be a better person and how to 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 do things and 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 those kind of articles are good and they're feel goody and 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 talk about things you know but they they don't present us something to get out of here how many times are there that the masters present something in terms of that's not the key to the door. That's the key to, to just a better samsara, but it doesn't get you out. Wouldn't you rather want to hear this, something that gets you out, not makes this place feel better? Once you're out, you come back in, and then you work on, on the pure land and, and raising up everything there be, because you understand. You understand how to do that. You understand how to deal with what uh, what Master Holmgren said, the foolish sentient beings. But only if you listen and you practice in the right way. That's what, what he's trying to tell you here about these possessions and illusions. So then it says, therefore, the Nirvana Sutra says, to understand the Buddha does not actually preach the Dharma is called having sufficiently listened to the Buddha's uh, preachings. So in terms of saying this, it's saying that he doesn't preach or teach the, the, the Dharma is that when you understand and you say, there's, there's nothing to teach. It is just simply the awakening. When we awaken, then we realize there was nothing to to preach or teach, and then we understand the Buddha never taught or preached, but he just did that for foolish sentient beings to have them stick around long enough to realize that. So there's two levels of of these teachings: is this just a basic level, ABCs? And if all the time you listen and you practice and it's just ABCs, ABCs, that's all you're good at, you know? And, and so I remember when I was a little kid, you know, and I really wanted to go to school and I was like four years old and my mom took me to the, to the kindergarten teacher and said, oh, look at Gilbert, he's very smart. He can say his ABCs. Tell the teacher you're the ABC. So there I am, ABCD, you know, that was good. But that was before kindergarten. After kindergarten, I put that down. I don't want to 
to do that would be foolish for me now. Are you an attorney? Yeah. Okay. Show me what you know. A, B, C, D, E, F. That would be stupid. Why do you want to stay at that level? So you have to move on. And you have to, you have to present the Dharma in a way calculated to make the people move higher up, to challenge them. Not to, not to just keep teaching them the same thing, but to challenge them. Sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox again, because this is what Holmgren's doing. Holmgren is, is, is presenting in the same way. Master Ling Chi presented in that way. You know, Master Wei, uh, Wei, Yin, um, Wei Neng was the same way. They're all telling you, this is the way, this is the profoundness. They're not holding anything back. Who holds it back? Why? Why would people want to hold this precious Dharma back? Either they don't understand it, don't get it, or don't realize how precious it is. We should never hold it back. Shuku, he used to say that if, if somebody asked you what pork tasted like and you didn't know, you never ate pork, but you smelled it cooking, at least you could tell the people what it smelled like when it cooked. And he was saying, you don't have to wait until you're enlightened to, to tell people at least what you have awakened to. It may not be much, but it's better than nothing. And I'm becoming more and more insistent in my later years, just simply because awareness of the finite amount of breaths that we all have and i want to get you guys to to do this i see people like uh, david and robert you know you you guys are um a little bit more on in years and i want to give this this dharma to you you know so that you you really can work and you haven't wasted a, a chance and we see people a little bit you know um uh, younger and those will be the, the teachers in the future. And so we don't waste this at all. And, and that's what it is when he's saying that there's no preaching here because it's just simply awakening to this. But we have to do that. We, we can't just keep teaching the same things over and over again and thinking we're going to have a, a, a very accomplished class of, of um, Buddha um, a practitioners. One of the things that I've been really um, surprised by, maybe in my own naivety, is that there are a lot of people that have never read sutras ever, ever in in the last retreat, there was a person that didn't even know what a sutra was. It, it made me want to cry. It made me want to say, sit down with me for an hour or 10 years and let me explain this to you and, and, and share this with you. No. And, and I, I really want to do that. It just comes from the heart that you want to share this with other people. And that's what I want you to do. It's not that I'm teaching you. I'm, I'm giving you what you're going to present to other people. That's just how it works. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled program. Sorry about that. Um, question four, why is maintaining awareness of the mind, the patriarch of all of the Buddhas of the past, present and future? And again here um, saying that that maintaining the awareness of the mind, one sees clearly that, that the Buddhas appear right there in this awareness of the mind. Why? Because this mind that you're using to, to maintain this awareness is not other than the Buddha mind. Once you awaken to that, it changes the whole game. Because now you know you're part of the Buddha clan, not your body, no, um, but 
that intrinsic understanding that's with, within you, that is the Buddha. You can then use this body for its maximum effectiveness for the time you have left here. Some of you have more time than others, but it doesn't matter. You can use it the best that you can, okay? And, and that's the part that when we see that, then we understand. And then, and what he's saying here is why is maintaining awareness of the mind, the patriarch, the, the, the Buddha, what we call the Adi Buddha, um, which is this primordial Buddha. Sometimes they say Samantabhadra is the primordial Buddha, Pushen Pusa, or Virachana, you've heard that name before, or and there's uh, Vajrahara, and, and as the primordial Buddha of the Dharmakaya, all of these are just trying to show you, okay, this is the essence of the Buddha. And this essence is the wellspring from which everything comes from. That's why they call it the Tathagatha Garbha. And from the Tathagatha Garbha, I don't subscribe to it saying, oh, there's this little tiny Buddha that's in, in, in you that's going to become a full Buddha later on. You come out of the box a full Buddha. All right. You don't need anything else. You have the Buddha mind. The only thing is, is that you mess it up. You don't know how to use it, but you have the complete faculties of the Buddha already. The embryo is all of the appearances that are arising in the mind in accordance with causes and conditions, because that Pratika Samapada is not other than the Buddha. And that's how the things work is through this. It is not through the machinations of some supreme being that says, you're going to fall down the steps. You're going to win the spelling bee. You're going to get a raise. You're going to get fired. It doesn't work in that way. There's nobody that's doing that. What's happening is in accordance with causes and conditions. But what's really good about those causes and conditions is we still have an ability to develop merit and transfer that merit to other people because that works too within the causes and conditions and that's very very powerful why because everything's created by the mind so we can generate the thoughts of deliverance to others that what is the deliverance is the awakening of the buddha mind within all sentient beings and in that is very, very powerful. So in terms of, of this maintaining the awareness of the mind, it is the power of the Buddha mind that one is generating and one is tapping into. And one sees that from the past, present and future because that's the way the mind works. The mind is not stuck in samsara it is in harmony with samsara, but it is far beyond samsara in its, in, in its expanse, so far beyond. Who knows how many samsara worlds are there? If they talk about 50 billion Buddha worlds, can you imagine how many samsara worlds are out there? We don't know that. We can't even think about it. We just think that, well, that's just made up stuff. Well, we're made up stuff. That's why we don't understand it, because we're made up. And when we're made up, we confine ourselves to this world and the potentialities within the world. But when you understand everything's created by the mind, then you begin to think outside the box of this mind. You begin to think of what you can do with this body. And you think outside of samsara itself. But you nevertheless have one foot in samsara to be able to, to, um, to deliver something means to fulfill those vows. This is how it works. We, we, we really don't understand that. So we're just hoping that the Buddha will, will come and, and save us from what? 
And what are they going to say? They'll say, you can come. And you go, really? Let me pack my bag. Don't bother packing your bag. What do you mean? Because you can't go. What? Well, because you're going to be gone like that. In another blink of the Buddha's eyes, you're going to be gone. But the Buddha will still be there. But you have to set aside the body. It doesn't mean that you should stop eating and wait for the Buddha bus to pick you up. It is quite to the contrary. One works harder, mindful of that, that this body is finite. The Shifu used to say, we only have a finite amount of breaths to take. And that hit me so hard, you know, because I'm looking at it and going, I want to make this one count. I want to make this one count. No. Since I've been talking, I'm hoping that I've made the breaths count. Um, I'm not getting too far in this. It's already almost uh, an, an hour of, of, of going, but let me see if I can get through some of this a, a little bit. So he says, all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future are generated within one's own consciousness. Very interesting. Now we look at this and we say, one's own consciousness and what the heck is consciousness then and one's own consciousness so we continue when you do not generate false thoughts the buddhas are generated within your consciousness so again he's kind of almost like teasing with this and saying okay well what is this consciousness when your illusions of personal possession, there's personal possession again, the I, me, mine, have been extinguished, the Buddhas are generated within your consciousness. You will only achieve Buddhahood. So you want to achieve Buddhahood. Who wants to achieve Buddhahood? So they raise their hand. By maintaining awareness, of the true mind. Therefore, maintaining awareness of the mind is the patriarch of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. So what is this awareness that we maintain? The, the awareness is very interesting because it is just mind. It is just the knowing of things that are arising in mind. The consciousness is we could say in the center stage and it will generate the buddhas are those um uh illusions are they temporary if we see that as some kind of a manifestation yes but the potentiality of the buddha mind no because that is unconditioned it's indescribable but if we go around drawing pictures of Buddhas, it's only an artist's rendition of what we think the Buddha is. In your heart is where you'll find the Buddha. So then he said, if one was, were to expand upon the four previous topics, how could we ever explain them completely? And that is so true. My only desire is for that you discern the fundamental mind for yourself. That's me. My only desire is that you understand the true nature of mind for yourself, that you awaken to it. That, that is what he's talking about. Therefore, I sincerely tell you, make effort, make effort. He's telling you, he already told you how to do it by maintaining the awareness of the mind. So then he says, make effort, make effort. And then he continues, I base my teaching on the Lotus Sutra in which the Buddha says, I have presented you with a great cart and a treasure of valuables, including bright jewels and wondrous medicine. Even so, you do not take them. What extreme suffering, alas, alas, if you can cease generating false thoughts and the illusion of personal possession, 
then all various types of myth, merit will become perfect and complete. Do not try to search outside yourself, which only leads to the suffering of samsara. Maintain the same state of mind in every moment of thought, which is maintaining the awareness of the mind. In every phase of mental activity, do not enjoy the present while planting the seeds of soup of future suffering. By doing so, you can only deceive yourself and others and cannot escape the realm of birth and death. So I, in this moment, eat my jelly donut. It tastes so good. I am enjoying it. And then my blood sugar spikes. And maybe I, I, I go up too high or eat too many donuts. And then I have to suffer the effects of, of having so many sugars. And you put in whatever you want in place of that jelly donut, and it's the same. And then we just go through again and again. And it, that's why it's saying by doing so, you only deceive yourself. What self? The self-nature of mind and others and cannot escape from the realm of birth and death. Make effort, make effort. Although it may seem futile now, your present efforts constitute the causes of your future enlightenment. And see, that's the thing, is, is that we don't understand that. We, it's like the, the Chinese have a saying that a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. We just keep stepping, 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 stepping. We don't have to look, how long is it going to take? You know, how long is it before we get to Disneyland? No, we don't have that kind of a thought. We just simply put one foot in front of the other. And, and by working in this way, although it seems like, why even bother? You know, um, Master Ling Chi said, don't be bedazzled by all of those masters and think that you're so unworthy and those masters are so great and they can accomplish all of these things. You know, forget that. Just do it yourself. Your present efforts constitute the causes for your future enlightenment. You want to become enlightened. You want to become awakened then do the things that you need to do to do that. If not, then just be ready for the next cycle of samsara, pack up your bags, you know, because for sure you're going to be on the next train back here, you know, to samsaraville. Or you have the choice that you can practice well and, and uh, get out of here. Do not let Time pass in vain while wasting energy. The sutra says foolish sentient beings will reside forever in hell as if pleasantly relaxing in the garden. What? There are no modes of existence worse than their present state. We sentient beings fit this description having no idea of how horribly terrifying the world really is. We forgot it. We forgot the lifetimes where we, we suffered, we starved, we drowned, whatever we did and whatever we did to others. We don't remember that, how terrifying this world is. But if you look at this world from different places, maybe a thousand miles away, maybe just down the road from you, people are starving. People have cancer. People are dying from horrific things. And we don't think that way until it happens to us. We don't understand that. We never have the least intention of leaving. And he says, how awful. How awful that we make a choice to stay here. 
Now, of course, I make a choice to stay here, but only for the purposes of delivering sentient beings. But I don't make a choice to stay here to vacation here. There's not a great place to vacation at. Okay. I think the positive thing is that cause and conditions never fail. If you practice sincerely, for sure, you can awaken. And awakening is liberation. When Gilbert is Gilbert, he suffers quite a bit. When he's not Gilbert, I'm not immune to adversities, but I can handle them a lot better than other times. And I know even if it's a good time right now, that joy will not last. Sometimes it, something will happen. But I also know that when I have bad times, that too will pass. So, so it's a matter of liberating from the idea of, of the samsara. That's not a bad deal. I hope you can understand that and practice in the proper way. But that'll be it for, for tonight. Thank you all. And I'll entertain questions. Oh, An Yi, did, did you, have you seen that picture before? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I didn't know what it said up at the top. I know it's uh, I took a picture of it. I would transcribe it. Okay. I'm just curious about that. You know what it what it would it would say. On Yi's our resident um, uh, professor and and of of art history and Buddhist art history. So, so it just so happened I have a question today. Oh, yeah. Um I was transcribing a, a lecture uh, a few months ago, uh, and uh, one participant asked the question uh, using awareness to meditate. And after that, I think you comment on this person's saying state of mind. And then it's not state of mind, it's mind. And then you say the difference is between life and death. Uh, I was shaken by it, but I could not really understand what you were talking about. So uh, I wonder if you can uh, uh, elaborate on that. It's really a great question. And it's one of those where um, I mentioned listening to something like that is like a turning phrase because it, it kind of shocks you to uh, kind of to your bones and you, you uh, something about it got you but but it's like uh, this matter of life and death so you you want to know what's the difference when we talk about state of mind um versus awareness awareness of the uh is of the mind is like turning the mind's eye inward we already have this mind so we have that and that that mind has never been born never been created um our bodies are born and created. They are conditioned in accordance with causes and conditions here. But the Buddha, the Buddha body is everything. It, the Dharmakaya is, is everything. It's my body, your body, the trees, everything that appears in, in everywhere, birth, death, food, shed, everything is in there people always talking about oh it's so wonderful i could feel this i met one with this or that you know and and they're talking about unified mind like it's some great state and i'm going well what about being unified with who you know but it is in this way too and we have to see it this way so so you know um if we're talking about unified mind please you know th this is not a mean you know like the end point the thing is, is, is that when I say it's a matter of, of, of life and death is because if you can maintain awareness of the mind, just like Master Hong Run says, you will be liberated from here. If you do not, and you continue to buy into the body and the body's possessions, 
then you will you will die and 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 you will be born and you will die again until you figure it out and that's that's why master Holmgren said how awful how awful we 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 just keep doing it and and we just like we go through the line we die and then right away we come back around to get back in the same line and they're going, what, is, what line is this? This is a line to come back to samsara. I, oh, I, I want to go there. And then you get back in line. I, I don't remember why I, I wanted to go back, but I don't remember that. But if, if this is the line, I'll, I'll be in the line. And, and Master Holmgren is looking at it and going, don't get in that line. It's a meat grinder. It, you're getting in. You're going to be born, good thing, but you're going to die. And you don't know how you're going to die. You don't know what's going to happen. Maybe good, maybe bad, but it's a matter of life and death. Life and then death. Life and then death. It just keeps going. But when the mind is liberated, it sees that from a different perspective. From not outside of it, but from remote from it, so that it is not it in the midst of it and clouded. It's like like the clouds are here, and if you're in samsara, you can't see anything, but the mind moves out and sees all the things that are happening and and understands it and then begins to see those things. So it's a good question, you know, in terms of it, but that state of mind is something where we are believing that there's somebody that is maintaining these kinds of thoughts and if we go to the shurangama sutra and we look at the shurangama sutra ananda was horribly confused about that where even at the end he thought or end of the first volume that he thought that it was he that saw from his heart, all of these things that were happening and saw the Buddha body and everything until the Buddha yelled at him, Ananda, that's not your mind. That's not your mind. It doesn't belong to this body. It doesn't belong to you. That's the Buddha body. And it's different because when we look at things from the idea of inside samsara, we cling to this idea of a um, a, an ego, a personality, or a life in being. And when we cling to it, then for sure it's a matter of life and death. We'll just keep coming back. But, but awakening to that, it gives us a choice. We come back on our own terms to fulfill our vows. But we don't, we're not stuck here um, in this samsaric some world blindly. We're here and we are aware. And that's a big difference because we can choose to come back or not to come back. And we come back, we choose to fulfill our vows. And that's a difference too. Okay. So hopefully that helps you with, with that kind of a, uh, that question. It's a good question because it's not a state of mind. A state of mind is something tr transitory. It's just temporarily there. Mind is mind. And it sees the things very clearly. It can see a state of mind, but it is aware that that is a conditioned state of mind. the The Buddha mind is 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 not conditioned. It can see conditioned appearances within it, but it in itself is not in a conditioned state of mind. Okay, okay, Jonah. Uh, Gilbert, could I uh, just? Uh... Um, echo something from the retreat that sure. you said yeah, you ahead. said you said awareness is not a state of mind and that was a turning phrase for several people i just wanted to share that uh that that you said that awareness is not a state of mind thank you yeah it was especially for a lot of people there that hadn't heard that before that was something that that kind of kind of uh shook them up because it, it made them think well then what is it? And it's not an it. So it, it's good. Okay, we have the Jonah. 
think this is the first time this person. There we go. I was finally uh, allowed to unmute. Um, hi. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I I appreciate the Dharma talk. Um, and I um, I guess I don't know that I have uh questions per se, but you can always you know I could formulate questions. Um, but what some of what struck me is when it you said something about this is so precious or this is so important. Um, and I agree with that, or, or I, I feel like I grasp that in some way. And, and if we're getting it, really getting it is being it as becoming it, you know, is growing into it. It's not just parroting it back or like a monkey see, monkey do, or, or maybe there's a lot of different levels of getting it or, or of hearing or of seeing or applying or understanding. Um, but I guess I'm having some reflections on how um hard the world can be just in the way that there seem to be a lot of people that are fairly worldly or don't want to listen or how hard it is for a human being to listen but from another perspective i guess there's just a lot of different perspectives on things there's no one truth um people also want it and they are hungry for it when it's presented in a way that they can grasp it and work with it um and i guess i'm i'm trying to work with what is it what can i offer um in the limited precious time that i have to offer and and kind of getting the message of only encouraging people to uplift them to understand them to see what's important and being very careful and gentle about how i critique people um based on how they can take it or not um i don't know if you if you want me to give you questions or if you want to say something um, I can more. I respond to what you said. Uh, and it was also somebody uh, in the chat had uh, said how to maintain awareness of the mind at all times. Um, this is uh, from Julia from, uh, from Taiwan, but it's the same, it's essentially the same question. What can you do? And the, um, you know, you can look at Samantha Bhadra, um, uh, uh, directions and one of them was to follow the Buddhas and study. So you study, and you um, you know you don't have to go around like Chicken Little saying that the the sky is falling. You'll only scare people. So you present the Dharma to people in accordance with their ability to understand, and you also serve as a representative um, of uh, uh, as a. Buddhist practitioner by body, speech, and mind at all times. So, you know, if you can't walk the walk, but you can talk it, it's not enough. You have to walk it. You have to be a good representative, a, a proper person through body, speech, and mind at all times. And then the people will look at you and say, you know, um, you know, you, you're somebody trustworthy. You know, why are you this way? And say, oh, well, because I practice Chan. No, what, what's Chan? No, it, it's just a way to harmonize with people and to, to see things. You know, you don't have to go and say, you know, um, if you're not a Chan practitioner, you know, you're never getting out of here because that will just kind of like parrot a lot of different religions that uh, or say that it is, it, we don't see things in that way. We see it from, from a long term thing, but you just become a better person you know, and you you become a non-selfish person. And in doing that, um, you know, your heart will begin to show you the way as you become an, a non-selfish person. And you kind of like spot that ego when it's coming up and it will tell you what to do, you know, not the ego, but mine will tell you what to do. And it'll tell you, okay, I need to study this or what am I lacking? You know, how can I improve in this way? How can I improve as as a, as a sentient being, um, we don't try to improve to be a polished sentient being, but in accordance with Buddha Dharma, that's a natural outcome of practicing is, is that we, we adhere to the Eightfold Path and the 37 factors of enlightenment and the six paramitas and the five precepts. All of those things naturally come up and are reflected um, in the present moment by virtue of our practice. So this is how you practice and this is how you you treat others. So you treat them in a way of understanding and, and you got part of it right. You know, you can't like 
like look down at them or say you know nothing or whatever you know you're never going to get anywhere in in that way you know um it's like people knocking on the door and saying you know jesus loves you no i'm, I'm sorry but don't you understand if you don't accept jesus christ in your heart you're going to be damned to hell you know that's not really persuasive um and, and it's one based on fear we shouldn't be practicing in that way when when master holmgren says how awful he's not doing it from the idea of fear as much as compassion and pity that we make these foolish choices but you are right that we in the presentation of the dharma to others um isn't in, in accordance with what their ability is to understand so maintaining the awareness in the present moment is seeing what is arising at any given moment and from that arising we we um we choose wisdom um to react to it via body speech and mind and it will work for you so hang in there and you'll 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 catch on to this fairly quickly okay jonah okay and um harry you're up next okay hi hi gilbert i can hear me i just wanted to uh, share something uh today i i went to tibet house in new york and i went to a book launch of um this book by uh, it's hard to see by um uh, rinpoche kentrell it's called the power of mind it's on uh, lojong and i just thought you would like the um the frontispiece it says when we look what is it that binds mind? Mind binds mind. What is it that frees mind? Mind frees mind. So I thought it's kind of your what you often say. Um, also, so you know, in this particular pit, it's you turn everything that you encounter, whether it's joy or mishap, into the path. And so one thing that he said in his talk that's uh, stay with me, I thought I'd share is he said that um, dislike is the food of suffering. Yeah, the, we're singing the same tune today. Yeah, so I just, just... So, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, it's very interesting. I think Sogo Rinpoche uh, once defined a mantra, you know, mm -hmm. um, and they, they asked him, what is a mantra? And he said, that which protects mind from mind. I <laughs> absolutely love that definition because you go, what? But it's true. <laughs> It's true. Once you understand that whatever mantra you say is so incredibly powerful, it could break down the the castles of Mara, you know, and shake the, all the worlds everywhere by just understanding that. I mean, it's just incredible. So what was said, that's a very good uh, beginning on in that book. It just just echoes what I've been saying all along. So it's not by accident that you ran into this today. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Okay, Tori, you're back with a question. Good. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to express how, how, how much I appreciate that. I, I saw, I, I've seen the three videos previous to, the, to this meeting and, and also in retreat that, that you will always tie things back to, um, to uh, compassion. And I just really appreciate that because I feel like a, a lot of these concepts, uh, when I get into it, you know, I, I get intellectually getting caught up in that, and, you know, that's my own ego. And when, when I can tie things back to compassion, you know, I kind of get out of that into intellectualization. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and today, the, it, it's just hitting me very hard that uh, looking at uh, that, that, uh, I, I don't know who wrote the book and I, since I'm new, I don't know what's going on, but uh, the words are saying that uh, um, we have very limited time. So make effort, make effort. And um, yeah, it's just like, it hits me really hard. And because um, it, it depends on the time of the month, you know, with, you know, like cycles and stuff. I, sometimes I just feel very tired and um, I just feel like whenever I sit down, you know, especially on the cushion, I just get tired. <laughs> and um, I just feel like uh, it, it, there's very limited time that within a month that I would feel energetic. 
you know, enough that I, I would, you know, make, make some, um, I, I would feel that I'm actually meditating in a, uh, a productive way. And other times I would just, I, I, I think I'm, I, I'm good with maintaining the body being still, but I just feel the drowsiness enough that I, you know, I, I don't feel it's productive. So that's my biggest struggle. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's some other ways. I mean, I, I know that if I look up for a little while, you know, it, it kind of helps me to become clear minded. But even that, when I'm really, really tired, it still doesn't work. Yeah, I think that um, I don't meditate for, for too long in the beginning. Just make your meditation perfect. And as you start to get drowsy, you know, uh, you can back off or come off your cushion so you don't start developing a practice of drowsiness. Uh, sometimes you can take a 10-minute nap Shifu used to do that. Master Shen Yang used to teach people how to, to um, uh, take a rest. And he said that if you sleep for 10 minutes, you can wake up refreshed as if, you know, you can last for, for several hours. So if you really are very, very sleepy, sometimes just sleeping before you meditate, even 10 minutes, you have to become adept at that or set your cell phone for 10 minutes. I do that during the day. You know, at lunchtime, sometimes I'll just sleep for 10 minutes and then uh, I'll get up and I'll feel much more refreshed. And then you can sit to meditate and your mind will be refreshed long enough so you can sit at least 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and you'll be fine during that. So you, you just have to break the pattern of the expectation of drowsiness. Sometimes it's not easy. And I've gone through that myself. And I actually had to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to, to meditate because then I said, now I've slept for most of the night. My mind should not be drowsy. And, you know, at 4 a.m. in the morning, especially in the wintertime, you know, you, you're, you're pretty cool. So you, you don't fall asleep too readily. So sometimes you just have to change the manner in which you do it, the lighting in the room, so it's not too dark, you know, whatever's there, just to, uh, to break that habit. And it's kind of a bit of a habit and you understand that it's frustrating to go through that, but you'll go through that. But it, the best way to do that is by perfecting your method of meditation and don't sit with a lazy mind. Don't sit with a mind that's scattered right as soon as you sit to on that cushion, you should already be on your method and that it will work little by little it work. So try that, you know, and um come back next week we'll see how it's going okay so good. thank you it, it, it's a very good question and i i welcome beginner questions as well as deep questions you know there's those things are are very uh important okay so i see chang shen's here did you have a question no question okay all right and uh yang yang lu Go ahead. Oops. Hi, bitch. You're on. Oh, you muted her again. There you are. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I have some noise. Um, yeah, I have a very uh, beginner question today. <laughs> uh, when you talk about um, if somebody, if the people, oh, not people, if the one uh, in the hell, um, then they, they enjoy, like, they, they, I, I forgot the original words um, in the book. Um, like they, they enjoy the, they enjoy being there. Um, then uh, they don't know uh, is there, uh, there, there is some better place, you know, other than the hell. Um, so, uh, so in that case, I'm thinking for those people, should they, be delivered? I mean, do they need to be delivered? Even more so, they need to be delivered because they, their life is more full of suffering than others. It was very interesting, uh, uh, Yang Lu. There was one time when uh, Master Shen Yang at a retreat was talking and he was saying, what do you think um, if we 
had a butcher that came to to just to the retreat. Should we let the butcher um, uh, come to practice with us? And so the people said, no, the butcher, he's always killing, killing, con, 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 killing, killing all of the animals all the time. He kills and kills and kills, you know. How can we let them practice? And then he went, and, and he's kind of like, he always used to do this, and he would just go, and Gilbert, what, what do you think? And, and I said, Shifu, of all the people that need to come to retreat, who more than a butcher should come to the retreat? Wouldn't he be most deserving of coming and, and to, to, to help them? And, and it's so in, in this way, the hell dwellers, are, they are there because of their ignorance. And, and Master Hongren was talking about that they enjoy, meaning not they really enjoy, they enjoy the present moment that winds them into hell but it's because of their ignorance that they enjoy it, but they don't really, they don't really um, enjoy it that much. And it's kind of an interesting thing about butchers. There are very few lifetime birth butchers. Um, you know, most of the time when people go to some place, a slaughterhouse or something, they don't last very long because it's, it just weighs too heavy uh, on them. But, but when, when he's talking about the people enjoying hell, it, what he's saying is, is that uh, like, let's say somebody likes to uh, beat up people and steal money from them or to, to rape them. So Master Holmgren says, that person must really love hell. Mm. You see, because that's where they're ending up next. They, but they do all these things via ignorance, not understanding what's going to happen to them. So to me, I see the people like this and what happens to them, the consequences are, are very, very great. And, and we cannot ignore that kind of a thing, you know, because the, the karma is so incredibly strong that when we see things like this, it, it's, it's very, very bad. And so that's why he's saying that they enjoy hell, not because they enjoy hell. Believe me, they're not enjoying hell but they're enjoying the um, the situations which lead them to hell because of their ignorance. That's the explanation of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, no problem. I, and good. The, you know, those are the questions that kind of clear up because they, this master is kind of presuming that you know some of the stuff. And But his, Master Holmgren here um, uh, was the fifth patriarch and he... Uh, he was one of the first ones that really did detailed uh, work on, um, on, on the Dharma and, and writing. Um, so his records are, are very incredible in terms of what he's saying. And the more I read this, the more I, I was just so amazed at, at, at how he's writing. And um, I must have picked up a good uh, translation of what he was doing because I was able to, to feel his heart in, in the work. And sometimes it's very hard to do that in interpretations. And, you know, we have people here that do interpretation like Esther, you know, uh, Wei Shang. It's not easy to do interpretation and to translate things um, with, uh, with the heart. Sometimes the translations are literal, but they, they're horrible because they make no sense because the person doesn't have the, their own training or practice to to convey that that message, so they just only just translate words, and 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 it isn't in that way. And we're we're you know we're really blessed to have some people here that that are serious in that. You know, Will Lee is another one. I haven't seen him for a bit now, um, but in any case, um, that's something. Okay. Any other last questions? Okay. Well, um, I'll see where we go next week. I, I may do a little bit of wrap up of this. Um, it's definitely taking me time to get through this, but it's worth it because I really hope you see how detailed it is in terms of reading things that you should not just read it and just go over it so quickly. You know, you have to understand that there's three 
uh, methods of conveyance of information. The first one is basic, and it's just telling you things. The the third or second one is profound, which is you're starting to understand more. And the third is esoteric, um, and this is not from the esoteric school. It's just the secret or hidden meaning that's there. It's not really hidden, and it's not really secret, but it it requires us to have uh, an advanced practice um, to be able to to understand what is not said in words. When I say advanced practice, it, it is an intellectual practice. Um, it, it is a practice of using our heart to, to see things. And that's, that's different, okay? Because the heart we're using is, is the, um, the mind's own perception. Okay, we'll pick it up next week. Thank you all for coming, I appreciate it you know, uh, bring more people. That's how we, we pass this on. So, you know, we did pick up uh, uh, maybe a couple from, from the retreat I had a, um, a week ago. So I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Very happy to see you here and, and asking questions. That's very, very good. You know, that's important. Okay, so we'll see you next week. Take care. I'm so full. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert. Hi, Gilbert. Hi, Gilbert. Thank, Gilbert. Thank, Thank you, Gilbert. Gilbert. Thank Gilbert. you, Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert. Have a good week. Gilbert. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Santa. Good to see you. Thank you.